You're listening to On Mission with Dr. Matt Davis, a podcast designed to explore the personal mission of everyday leaders. Hear from men and women who are making a difference in their corner of the world and discover what keeps them on mission. Welcome to On Mission with Dr. Matt Davis. I'm Jonathan Sheely. We are joined today by Dr. Jody Herbert, Professor of Mathematics in the Department of Applied Science and the Math Education in School of Education at Maranatha. Dr. Herbert is a Maranatha alumna and lives in Watertown. Her first formal job was a part-time position at a children's library, which she found fun because she loves to read. Apart from reading, Dr. Herbert enjoys traveling and seeing new places and spending time with her extended family. One of her favorite meals is a three-course fondue meal that the Herberts have as a family Christian tradi- Christmas tradition, which is Christian. Yeah. <laughs> during football season, Dr. Herbert cheers for the Green Bay Packers, and during basketball season, she, as well as I, cheer for the University of Kansas Jayhawks. Dr. Herbert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Oh, no. We got two Jayhawks. I'm surrounded, You're surrounded. by Jayhawks. So, but you are, not a, you are not a graduate of Kansas. You are a graduate of Kansas State and Maranatha, but Kansas State, they're the Wildcats, but you are a Jayhawks fan? Yes. <laughs> so, How's that go over? <laughs> well, I grew up in Kansas, so I was already a fan of the Jayhawks before I ended up at grad school, and my loyalty is just not that easily bought. Oh, wow. Even to be your alma mater, I mean, that's uh, that's pretty hardcore fandom. I love it. Uh, and it's so, easy to root for the you know the first all time wins team the first, in America. What does that yeah. mean? The number first, one all time wins team. Oh, the number in America. they've won more than any other program. Yes, even Duke. Yes, in North Carolina. Yep. Rock chalk Jayhawk. Rock chalk Jayhawk. Because they have to play each other. They also every have reg- the first in regular season conference championships. Sixty three of them. You got any stats you want to share? You're the math person. No stats. <laughs> okay. I got you. <laughs> I got two pages. <laughs> Okay, I got two well, and a half pages. I don't know if we want to go. No, two, two and, and a half, half pages of Kansas. <laughs> oh my goodness, the editors will be going crazy on this episode to trim out say, all of that nonsense. Let's just say they're the best. I also cheer for the Saber Cats. That's well, you good. better. That's you good. better. And uh, of course, what year did you graduate from Maranatha? 2006. So before the change and back in the Crusaders days, do you mm-hmm. still have a Crusaders sweatshirt or two? I have a little bit of Crusader paraphernalia. I've got an entire bin at home that's just filled with the old logo and the names. The so I'm just waiting for throwback day. You know, I'm going to be decked out. We'll be ready to go. <laughs> Deck out the entire staff. Absolutely. Yeah, I could get everybody. I could, I could hook <laughs> everybody up. It'll, it might smell a little musty, but that's okay. We won't worry about that. So I'm very much looking forward to having you on today, but I need to know what a three-course fondue meal actually is. I I know that fondue, I think of it as either cheese or chocolate. Is that involved in most fondue? Yeah, we have a a cheese course uh, and then a chocolate course, of course. And in the middle, we have a a meat course that we uh, take meat and and dip it into hot oil, and it cooks the meat. And um, That counts as fondue? Yes. So I love it. I, let's I'm go. I mean, you should have brought samples. Yeah, yeah, I, know. I feel I'm a little hungry. <laughs> now I'm feeling like we need to try it's some fun. fondue. I'll, I'll talk to the food service staff yeah, and we'll right. see if we can get some fondue going. I've only ever seen him do a chocolate fountain. And I saw a freshman trying to stick his head underneath the chocolate fountain <laughs> at one point and I said, hey, no, 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 we don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's not allowed. Yeah. So no more chocolate fountain. A little you know, rough on the clean. Do you have to remind have nice my things. nieces that they have to take the food off the fork before they put it in their mouth? No double dipping. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Yeah. Is that that's Skewers not that's frowned best. upon? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, at least you're hygienic about dipping your food in a common sauce. So, what is your favorite thing to dip in the chocolate? Um, I really like the the, the marshmallows, and I really like fresh fruit dipped yeah. in chocolate. Yeah. Pineapple. You ever tried mm. a Snickers? I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Snickers in the fondue? Yeah. I mean, why not? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> let's go. Well, we uh, always have a tough question for our guests. This is the On Mission podcast, mm-hmm. and so Jonathan's going to hit you with a deep question here right at the beginning. Do you have a personal mission statement? And if you do, how did you develop it? Well, yes, I do. Um, I have had this for a while, but I have to admit I hadn't really thought through how to state it until recently. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, 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 w- I would say that my, my ultimate goal in life is to um, glorify and serve my God and Savior. And and I know that sounds like a pat 
Sunday school answer, uh, you know, something that any believer could say. But I, I really want when I get done with my life, God to be able to look at me and say, Jody, I created you with these gifts, these abilities. I gave you these opportunities and blessings. And yes, I allowed you to go through these hardships. But with my spirit and my grace, you accomplish the purpose I have for you. And, and I know that a lot of believers can say that, probably more eloquently than I did. But, but I think it's the, the bits and pieces of all of those things that God puts in our life that then add up, if I can allow a math pun, mm-hmm. into my unique personal mission, which mm-hmm. would include a career in higher ed as a math professor at Maranatha and include being an active part of my church and include being a, a godly and loving you know, sister and daughter and aunt and and friend and 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 teacher. Mm-hmm. So I think I think my personal mission really is just to be all of those things, to glorify God and to serve Him by serving other people. So how how has that developed throughout your life? Have you have you always felt that way? Like there's this sense of um, God's will in my life that that he, something specific or something that I need to be preparing for and 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 pursue after. Uh, because that's a very broad thing, and a lot of people could fulfill that in a lot of different ways, mm-hmm. a lot of different professions. But somehow you have, you know, wormed your way through life to a p- specific place uh, that wasn't easy to arrive at. I mean, you have an accomplished academic career and teaching career, and so how d- how did it end up that way? Well, I grew up in a ministry home, and and my folks are both very much, you know, find God's will and do it. And, and, and so then pretty young, I guess I was about 13 at camp, um, I had committed to serving the Lord, whatever that was going to look like. And, and yes, camp decisions, you know, they can go one of two ways. They can be, you know, emotional high experiences. But, but for me, it was really a commitment. But I didn't, I didn't know what that was going to look like. Um, so then I ended up at Maranatha and I, I thought, well, I'll go into education. Um, I have education in my background. So that wasn't really a big stretch and I picked math because I thought that was fun and exciting and you know interesting (coughs) and and so I thought I thought you know is gonna teach junior high high school math I actually had uh, an administrator at Maranatha challenge me with the idea of being a math professor my freshman year really and um, that was some long-term planning I know I, I was 18 and I thought I have a plan I know what God wants me to do and college professors are old yeah. So I don't think so. I know. I just, just kind of dismissed it, you know, went on with my plan. Well, <laughs> my first job out of college was teaching college. Joke's on me, right? <laughs> and um, I loved it. And it was, was awesome. Was that some kind of a graduate assistancy or how did you? It was more like an instructor position, um, oh, okay. kind of a, a last minute. Uh, they needed someone. I So I did my student teaching in the fall, which meant I needed a job for the spring. Yeah. And they needed a teacher for the spring. And so the Lord That's just That's not easy to find a teaching job that starts in January. Mm. Yeah. It's a little easier in math ed. Oh, okay. They're but. always open, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed employment, I Guaranteed would guess. Guaranteed employment. Science or math yes. education. Yes, yes. So That's anyway, I, I just, I loved it, and, and God used that to confirm that I needed more training, um, but that was that was what kind of drew me to this you, career. You found yourself loving it, but also feeling like, ooh, I'm a little over my head. I need to get some more yes. education. Yes. Do you think that's part of the call, the, the calling, pursuing God's will is also sort of the way we prepare for that? Well, I think being, you know, where God wanted me to be at that moment, then you know, God opened the right doors and, and he then gave me the right, you know, like the passion and the direction that I needed. I mean, I wouldn't have thought at 13 that I was going to be teaching college math. Um, what, what, what did you think you would do at that point? Oh, I, I guess I just figured at this point, I probably would be a mom, maybe teaching a little bit part time. And, um, I, I also am a musician. So, yeah. you know, maybe, yeah, you know, teaching music lessons out of my home or I don't know I just normal, whatever whatever th- normal dream things. of the day yeah. right I thought medicine yeah. but I, oh. I don't really handle like blood and all of that sort of thing very well so God closed that door in a hurry yes I, I th- there is a bit of that in the medicine mm-hmm. world right so you ended up 
uh, teaching your very first year out of, out of college, but that's really not the ideal level of academic preparation for a college professor. So you kind of got a little bit of confirmation that hmm, maybe this is interesting and maybe I can do this. And so you pursued graduate school at that point? Yes. And where'd you end up and how? Yeah, so I um, I had started actually while I was teaching, I looked to see if there was any way I could do both at the same time, uh, teach and pursue graduate work in my field. And there are lots of areas of graduate work where you can do that. Yep. Um, but, but mathematics is maybe a little bit unusual in that regard. It just doesn't, wasn't optimal. Um, and, and I did have a student ask me the other day, you know, do they have programs like that? And, and online is growing. So those options are increasing. But at the time, it just wasn't a really great option. So I knew I needed to um, stop teaching, go into um, grad school full time. And I had um, when I first started, I was looking for a school that was close either to where I was currently living or someplace, uh, in this case, close to where my parents were so I could, you know, mooch off of them while I was already paying rent at my house. I could take classes in the summertime. And um, and so I ended up at Kansas State. And, and they weren't 100% sure they wanted me as a grad student because my undergrad is in math education. And, oh, and so there they're were looking some, for straight math. Yes. There oh. were some holes then in my preparation, but they said, we'll let you come provisionally. We'll see mm. how things go. And so after a that summer, had to be a little nerve nerve wracking. <laughs> it was very challenging under the microscope, right? Yeah. And and a very different environment. And it was very challenging. Um, but, you know, again, this was what God had for me. And, and he opened all the right doors. And then a year later, I ended up uh, being there full time. So I got a position as a as a teaching assistant and uh, finished a master's and then a PhD. So you stayed at K-State and did the teaching assistantship all the way from a master's through mm -hmm. a PhD. Yep. How many years did that take? It took me five and a half. Wow. But that's pretty quick. I, yeah. Uh, pretty quick for, for that program. All right. So a PhD is a research doctorate, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And <laughs> that's that's the real deal, right? So normally I'm thinking PhDs in theology or in, in uh, philosophy or in history, and they're doing these dissertations and studies and all this literature and everything. What does a what does a dissertation in math PhD look like? Yeah, so you you um, start asking questions, and really we start that at the undergrad, maybe even high school level. You know, like what are these open questions that we don't know the answers to yet? And then you get a lot of the background in your undergrad program and even through your master's program and, and you start exploring, how can I solve this problem? Or uh, what about if I, if I switch this you know, equation or this formula and I change the conditions, you know, what's gonna happen? So your, your goal as a PhD student is to prove something that hasn't been proven before um, in whatever field you end up being in. Uh, so, you know, develop a theorem, develop a hypothesis, and then prove it, and then publish it, and, you know, so on. So you, you pushed out the, the, the boundaries of human knowledge in some <laughs> particular area with your research, groundbreaking well, research? Well, I also had an advisor. <laughs> what, did, what, what, did, what was your thesis? Uh, my uh, dissertation was on the boundedness properties of bilinear pseudo-differential operators. Ah, uh, we know them well. Yes. Yeah. Remember that? I was reading about it this oh, morning. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was reading my devotions about that this morning. Let's see. Uh, Pushing the what, boundaries of human life. Yeah. <laughs> what, what does that mean in plain English? So, so when we talk about things that are bounded, we think about things that are either growing without bound or they stay small and, and there's no way for them to get too big or too small. And so we wanted to know, okay, if, if we had um, like – a function, something where you where you are doing something to a variable, and we explore, you know, different things that we can do to that function. Does it stay bounded, or does it all of a sudden, you know, grow to infinity? Um, and and so my my dissertations in in analysis, that's the field that I um, studied, and um, that's kind of the same thing that calculus is in. So we ask a lot of those same kinds of questions in calculus. You know, how fast does this function grow, or how fast does this function diminish to, and and so that's the kind of thing. I'm glad that there are people in the world that understand those things because I don't. But w what does that apply to? 
Yeah. So um, computer the, science and, <clears throat> and algorithms and and cryptography, or I mean, t- tell me what fields would you? Where is that useful? Sure. So I my my dissertation and the, what I studied is all what would you be in the field of pure math, right? It's not um, with an intent necessarily to apply it in a specific realm, but well, dovetailed- it always starts there though, right? And then they. And they kind of discover so, sometimes applications. Um, historically sometimes the application drives the math development okay. sometimes the the math development all of a sudden becomes useful later on uh, people just wonder what if and then oh look it was useful um, surprise uh, yeah <laughs> 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 um, but for for me it, it was in in pure math and it wasn't necessarily application centered but that same field uh, with application um, is a field that does a lot of things with like signal processing. Mm. So even um, compressing audio data so that we can have a podcast, right? Um, how do you store that memory and then recover it? Um, if you're doing digital image processing or, you know, you've got satellites and you want to, you know, view the surface of the earth, how do you make sure that what you're seeing is actually what the picture is saying it is? And um, I always you know, wonder that. Uh, yes. <laughs> any, any kind of signal. So if you're sending... Like um, in medicine, uh, you know, like an EKG or something like that, those are, um, you know, these waves, sound waves, and they have to go in and people have to be able to interpret what they're reading. Um, Basically, you're saving lives. <laughs> right. I mean, because yeah. if those, I mean, literally, the, there's there's medical applications for these things. My dad went in and got an MRI the other day and his doctor was able to interpret it and see inside his body because of somebody who understood how that all could be right. sent through and, and reinterpreted and that that meant that there was, you know, this density here. And I've always been fascinated by that, mm-hmm. although I've, you know, never even scratched the surface of understanding it. But I think it's incredible that uh, you're you're able to find something that nobody's written about because that's really one of the harder things, right, in the, in the development of a dissertation is find, finding something unique uh, to explore and... I, I know some. I have some friends going through that right now, where everything they propose, and then somebody finds, oh well, a guy already wrote about that, you know, ten years ago, and so try again, and it can take a while to to come through that. So five and a half years in the PhD process, and then how did you end up back at Maranatha? Was that always the plan, or? Well, I I did want, I did really want to be in a Christian environment teaching. Um, again, my, my goal from you know young was to to serve the Lord somehow f- full time if I could. Um, but there, you know, Mar- Maranatha had math professors obviously because I came through the program. They had they had people, and so I didn't know that I would get a job here. But um, you know, as it turned out, uh, about the same time that I was finishing up. Um, the professor that I had uh, was looking to retire. Dr. Malmanger. Dr. Malmanger. Mm-hmm. Legend. And, <laughs> yes. And so he actually, actually, I think he had to hang in an extra semester for me to get the, the half a year because um, I wasn't quite ready. Um, but um, I, again, I was in contact with, you know, um, Dr. Brock, who was the uh, VP for academic affairs at the time, and, and he was saying, we're going to be having someone retire, and yep. he knew that I was I remember working those, on this. our side of those discussions. I just wondered yeah. how much of it was on your radar, at, you know, early on versus, you know, once the doors were opening as you were finishing the program. Uh, I remember on our side, it was like, man, if if she would come back and teach, this would be perfect timing. And it was just like the Lord was doing something. Right. You know what I mean? And and sometimes when God opens doors that way, this circumstance is changing here and this is coming here and it just comes together yeah. and you say, oh, wow, God did something. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily I couldn't have us. made that happen. Right, yeah, I couldn't have made that happen. I, I would like to have, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody can think that far ahead, right? Right. right. Um, but it, it goes all the way back to your freshman year when somebody just randomly you know, said to you, hey, you ought to think about being a college professor someday. Right. And it's now nine and a half years later, right. and you are. Right. That's an incredible f- amount of foresight <laughs> right. to see that kind right. of potential in somebody, too. Right that this person really has got what it takes. Do you ever see that now on the reverse side? You're a professor, and do you think about that? Like the how meaningful that little word of prediction or encouragement from your faculty member, and now you are that person, although yeah. not as old, but you are, <laughs> right. you are that person. Yeah. Uh, does that inspire you to you yes, know, see I, the same <clears throat> kind of potential? 
I, I feel like maybe I, I hear more of the horror stories like, you know, I had this one teacher that said this one thing and, and mm. you know, they mm. were terrible. Um, I actually, um, this is on a slightly more serious note, um, I, I had a really um, very wonderful home life and, and I don't, I mean, I never really had all of these, you know, problems that a lot of our students are going through. And when I realized what our students were coming in with the burdens they had, um, I started taking um, the classes in biblical counseling through Maranatha because we can take a certain number of classes. And I thought, I need help. I need help. So I'm not that teacher that, you know, with the best of intentions. I mean, I think we all have the best of intentions, but still the teacher that is is. It, 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 unintentionally hurtful mm. and and so so I kind of maybe am more concerned about that side like not hurting any of them on accident or because I had a bad day <laughs> um, but at the same time yes like maybe having an opportunity something that I could say in a class or just walking down the sidewalk whatever could change somebody's life I Isn't think that's that exciting wild? yeah that's <laughs> wild and, and the Lord uses us uh, to encourage, inspire, um, give ideas about, you know, and, and to notice. You've said a few things that just kind of spurred that word in my mind, the word we, we've got to notice, we've got to be aware, empathize, uh, whether it's the potential that that student themselves may not see uh, or whether it's the struggle that they may be going through and how we can try to encourage. And that seems like a big part of your ministry, and yet that's not really an in the classroom at the chalkboard kind of a ministry you you see it as broader than that don't you yeah we i mean it's not part of giving a grade but um but you know they're they're people and they come in with you know burdens and they come in with needs and they come in with talents uh some of our students are are incredibly gifted and 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 some of them have greater struggles and challenges and it, you know, they're all kind of, you know, built differently with, you know, unique issues. And so I'm definitely wanting to communicate math to them. I love math, but at the same time, all of the other things play a role too. And that's where sometimes you can help. And, and I think teaching at Maranatha as opposed to just teaching at a secular university, I think is, is, is is better. (laughs) Well, it gives you certainly the freedom and encouragement to, go beyond and to speak truth through God's word and how it can help them. And you're rubbing shoulders with the students at church and serving together in capacities outside the classroom where they see that you're, you're a little more well-rounded of a, of a person, of a character in their story than just the scary professor at the front that they only ever see in class. And in the math program, due to its nature, I would imagine that as students go through the math education program, they they tend to see you a lot, right? Right. So both both our math program, that's relatively new, but the the math program and the math ed, um, you know, I I will see students, um, you know, pretty much every semester, at least for one class. Uh, sometimes I have them for multiple classes oh boy. in the same semester. <laughs> better, better be good, right? <laughs> very lucky. <laughs> yes, uh, they are. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we, we do get to spend quite a bit of time together for those that are in one of those two fields. That was a little bit how it was for me. Uh, Corey Faffey was one of the only business professors when I came through, it seemed like. Um, and so I had him every semester. And it's amazing how much insight you pick up on an individual and how much you pick up about how to live Mm -hmm. the character aspects and and how to be a christian professional and how to carry yourself and prepare that's caught not taught Mm -hmm. right they they say that you know more is caught than taught Um, and i i think that's the role model aspect of the professor job right which is very sobering yeah (laughs) it's it's a huge responsibility (laughs) Yes, especially when we think about our heroes, and now right. mm-hmm. the right. idea that you could be somebody's hero, you know, right. that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> but it's also a, a big time. You, you take that as a responsibility, don't yes. you? Yes, it's very seriously. I mean, it it it's 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 daunting if you think about it, but then you, you're not doing it by yourself, right? You have God assisting you through that. Now you said you had a really good family life growing up, and. I know a little bit about your family, but tell me about the Herbert family. Yeah, so my dad is a Christian school administrator, and um, 
he also teaches um, and he's in a small Christian school. So he coaches and does music and, but he teaches math. So he was my oh, he high does. school math okay. teacher. And my mom is a uh, piano teacher and she also does a lot of volunteering for music at the school. And so, um, you know, grew up in a home. We were in church on Sunday. We did, uh, went to Christian school, Christian camp, the whole thing. Um, I have um, actually lots of, uh, I have an uncle that's a Christian school administrator. I've got a couple uncles that are pastors. Um, so a lot of heritage in my family. And then my siblings are all in ministry, either in education or pastoral ministry. Um, and you guys so. are, are musical mm-hmm. as a family. That was, always, was that always a big part of your family activities growing up, or how did that come about? Yes, I think my mom was very determined uh, that we were going to grow up to learn music. She's a piano teacher, and... Um, it was, it was just, they, my mom and dad had decided they were going to make sure that we, you know, took lessons and, um, you know, my mom didn't necessarily want to teach us all the time. So my dad, you know, worked the extra jobs to pay for us to have lessons. And, um, so I, piano is probably my main instrument, but my older sister, she's a horn player. That's her kind of main thing along with piano. Um, they used to call it the French horn, but now all of a sudden it's just the horn. And I don't I know when both. that happened. I don't know when that happened I feel happened like it either. happened at some point while I was away. Like, I was here, it was the French horn, I went away for about 10 years, I came back, it's the horn. Mm-hmm. And I don't know when this, who decides that sort of I, thing? I Is it the government? Out, I don't know, but I found that in college. Like, I came from high school where it was the French horn, and yeah. then I came to college and it was just the horn. And I was the like, horn. There's and lots like, of horns. Well, there's lots of horns. <laughs> yeah, it's the horn section, you know, <laughs> right. it's the whole deal. Right. They're the yeah. horn. Yes, yes. Okay, whatever, yes. horn people, right? Am yeah. I right? Right. But yours is piano? Uh, yes, and, and and I mean I play other instruments, but but piano would be Chip my main play? one. What uh, does Chip play? Chip plays trumpet and piano. Yeah, um, and Trisha plays like the entire work. And and Trisha plays uh, French horn and clarinet and piano as well. And we should put out a plug. There's now a John the Sixth. Is On the this way. Right? On the way. On the way. Yes. Whoa, holy moly! All right, so he's John the Fifth, Herbert. Mm-hmm. That's my brother. Yep. Yeah, Chip. We call him. So I guess. His son will be Chipper or something. I know we got to come up with <laughs> something. All right, I'll let him know. <laughs> that's We've pretty named exciting. Your son, man. John, well, <laughs> I think it's that's the problem when you're the fifth. There's like a lot of pressure, right? Right. Do you think he feels that pressure? John yeah, well, if sixth. he doesn't, he should. You're gonna put the pressure oh, yeah. on, okay? <laughs> I'm sure you're a good. Aunt. What are older sisters for? <laughs> right. Pressure, right? Yeah, okay, so I have a question about the music, though. All right. Yes. So there's a. There's a connection between music and math. I was going to right. ask her that, too. Good question. So can you talk a little bit about that? <coughs> um, I, well, I think they both, uh, so they both have a lot of, in common. Uh, they both are expressing ideas with their own kind of unique language. Um, and mathematics is useful for describing a lot of different patterns that we see and music is all about patterns so when you are whether it's it's a you know musical pattern or whether it's a visual pattern or whatever it is um you know i think math is the language that really does the best job of describing that um and so you know we see intervals and we see you know frequencies of sound and all of those sorts of things and and order and rhythm and patterns yeah um that are all mathematical There's a deeper question in all that to me that that's sort of philosophical about the universe as God's created it. Mm -hmm. And and I I can't fathom how evolutionary scientists can even just deal with math, because from an evolutionary, chaotic, random uh, origin, math shouldn't exist. I mean, is there any discipline (laughs) that more perfectly describes the order and design of the universe than math? Why does math exist, right? I mean, how how is it that we can rely on consistency of two plus two is four and all the complexities from there that that really describe and- And And it it is surprisingly consistent. Um, I, I tell my students, you know, when they get into my class, anything they've ever learned before and anything they should have learned before, it's all fair game because it's all connected. And and, and and any other discipline that you're in where you have multiple people all kind of coming up with their own ideas and trying to put them into a, a single hole, it doesn't really work very well. So mm. there has to be some sort of a designer 
behind this process. Otherwise, it, it, would, it would fall apart. Yeah. And, and you know, even when we discover new things and they seem revolutionary, once we see them and we see them kind of in context and we kind of nail down what they actually look like, it's like, oh, yeah, that does work with all of the stuff we already knew. Mm -hmm. But they always use that word, discover. Yeah. Right? They're always discovering mathematical principles and no random chaos origin would ever produce that kind of ordered system to where those of us with the intelligence being the pinnacle of evolution, mm -hmm. right, the human mind, but yet we're discovering things that are infinitely more complex and that have always existed yeah. and that have always described the universe as it works, whether you're describing the motions of the planets in the, in the space or the infinitely small bacterial, you know, smallest, right. simplest forms of life. I'll give you an example. Today I was doing a biology discussion in my worldviews class. And so that's where a lot of this th deep thinking is coming from for me because normally I'm on like more of a meat and potatoes guy. But uh, the, the bacteria is the smallest form of life. And yet it is made up of 100,000 million atoms, all that have to be the right kind of atom and the right location in, in the right thing. Because if you have 999,000 million of right, but just the one wrong, then it, it won't be life. Right. It's, it's in, right. It, by the way, don't tell Congress that that number exists, all uh. right? Because <laughs> they'll raise the dead yeah. ceiling. To, but uh, the idea that that would be a coincidence is staggering, really. Mm -hmm. And like that's probably just... why you need billions and billions of years, I guess, because yeah. otherwise, how do you explain? Well, I feel like there's a difference between, in our terminology even, Christians recognize that we are recognizing these patterns instead of discovering them. There's a difference between m humanity um, seeing something come to life for the first time as a discovery or going to a part of the world or a part of science that has never been touched before. We know that we are just recognizing what God has put there. That's different than uh, maybe their ideas of, oh, we didn't even know this existed. Well, we knew right. something existed because God made it. So, so in math, and, and actually I bring this point out in my history of math class, um, there's a, a very nice balance, I think, between um, you can see bits and pieces of what must be inherent that, 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 are, that are beyond human you know, God created it. And then there are bits and pieces that are our responsibility. You know, the symbols that we use to describe math and to explain it, you know, even the number zero, like, you know, ancient civilizations didn't all have a number zero. And that has developed over time. Um, and, and the idea of having a symbol to represent nothing, you know, is kind of revolutionary at one point in time. Mm. And, and yet, you know, while that part of it is you know, man's responsibility to participate in the, the development of the discipline, there's still underlying things that are true regardless. And that's the part that, that I think God created. Right. And we're discovering those things. Yes. They existed. The pattern's there. It's just a matter of us to learn how to describe it. Describing it and the formulas and the proofs, that, that's us just kind of trying to properly describe the complexities of an infinitely complex right. system. Coming up with the, the, I mean, it's not words per se, but the, the words to describe what it is we're seeing, yes. But isn't that reflective of all disciplines where we're discovering it in a classical humanities uh, per perspective? We're recognizing those patterns that God has put there, and we're describing to other humans how those patterns work. It just happens to be in your discipline is math. There, there's something unique, though, about math, right, in that, in that respect? I would like to think so, but I could be a bit biased. Oh, you should be, because <laughs> you're a professor. <laughs> well, how do you describe the difference? Um, well, <clears throat> so, I mean, I guess I think that when we're coming up with theorems and, and we're you know, coming up with uh, statements about fact, um, in, in mathematics, when we prove something, at this point at least, uh, it's, it's pretty much that you know, once it's established, it's, it's well established across, it doesn't get overturned very much. Um, and new things you know, get discovered, but they, they rarely overturn previous discoveries. And that's not necessarily true in a lot of the other sciences, mm -hmm. and certainly yeah. not true in like the soft sciences or, or in the, the arts, um, where you know, if, you know, people might look and say, well, I'm going to throw out that previous genre of art or music or whatever it is and replace it with this new one. Mm. Um, so there's a, a little bit more of a, a you know, kind of a building on always the, the previous thing and 
and, I, and again, I think that the reason we can do that is because we're not building our own things. We're, we're just discovering what God has put in place. Oh, I like that. There, there is a movement, though, to, uh, well, they call it decolonize math. Have you read about this and seen what the <laughs> ideas are behind this? response. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but that the idea that somehow Western civilization, which is usually code for Christian, uh, Anglo-oriented, uh, and so the idea is that somehow math is just one way to describe these things and that there can be multiple truths and multiple maths. And I think, in a way, if postmodernism is going to be a viable theory, they have to decolonize math because more than almost any other discipline, math speaks to the existence of a truth right. <laughs> because yeah. of its repeatability and, and accuracy. I think, I think in that case, you have to let your worldview dictate what you think as opposed to the other way around. Like you can't actually think and discover and then let that dictate your worldview because if you did, um, yeah, you would find these these hard truths that are are just facts, and and this idea that um, mathematics is somehow a Western civilization thing. When people say that, they just don't know their history of mathematics. I mean, the the different civilizations across our globe all contribute different ideas to math, and they're surprisingly consistent, even where they have different. You know, they might have a different numbering system but they're all still counting and you know they might have a different you know way of doing the arithmetic and and how they notate it but they're all still looking at the same ideas and quantifying and so on um and and it's it's really a global thing it's not any one civilization i mean certainly at different eras in time, you know, there was a, a period of, of Greek prominence in mathematics and a period of, you know, Egyptian prominence in, in mathematics and, and so on. But it, it's, it's not, mathematics is not a Western discipline. Right. Well, it so, depends on who you talk to, I guess. But it's a, it, you're saying it's a modern idea that somehow it is a Western construct. Right. And, and, and to say that so that therefore we have to get rid of math because of its, you know, inherent badness of some sort I think is um, short-sighted what about from a gender standpoint were you a rare bird as a, a lady in the stem fields and especially in the higher levels of the PhD program uh, yes it, it's it is um, true that in you know the upper level of stem um, women are scarcer than men um, I think when I started my graduate program there were maybe three or four women in the master's and PhD program. And I was the only one of them that was uh, both uh, American and white. <laughs> um, mm. So it was, you know, it was pretty uh, rare. But at the same time, um, I was very privileged. I never really, I, I'm not saying this is true for everybody's experience, but I never had any pushback on in terms of my gender um, and, and I was very privileged. My academic advisor was a woman. Um, oh, really? And uh, she was phenomenal. So I got to, to work closely with her, and she was a role model. And um, so, yeah, I, I didn't have any, any problems, although we do need, you know, probably more women in those areas. Does, does it bring it? Do you bring a different perspective to those conversations, do you think, because of your perspective as a woman? Because I'm wondering why you said we need more women in right. mathematics. Um, I don't know that it would change the discipline any, but it might change people that are naturally inclined to do that, to, to recognize that they, they can do that. I see. Um, and so if, if that's where God wants them to be, you'd hate to say, well, you know, just because you have those gifts and those talents and that inclination, you shouldn't do it because you're a woman. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's going to impact mathematics, the discipline, um, but it might impact the 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 world of like you know the experience um and and maybe we'll change someone's like i, I can do that i can participate in absolutely that. you want to yeah. inspire whoever it is right. regardless of their of right. their gender right. that you see that they have this gift that they have this disposition is there right. a disposition towards mathematics and studying that do you think do you ever see right. that i mean obviously <laughs> some people are better at it than others and pick it up right. more quickly Right. Well, I, I think um, 
it, it, it's a challenging thing and some people do have more aptitude for it and I think when the, the aptitude coincides with the you know I also have a personality that can um, you know handle that kind of you know maybe it's it's uh, uh, you know you have to just stick with it and, and be okay with not getting an answer right away and some people don't like that mm. um, you mm -hmm. know so it, it, I think you have the, those things that all kind of coincide to make you know somebody that's a good mathematician or or willing to pursue mathematics so there's math education my math teacher in high school was john kofer and he's with the lord now and and uh he inspired a lot of us to take elective math classes that was a rare thing all right in uh -huh. high school but you know we we liked mr kofer so much as a teacher that we took advanced math and calculus because we wanted to have him again, mm -hmm. right, as seniors in that. And in the Christian school, uh, he was an incredible teacher. But he said one of the reasons he was a good teacher is that he struggled in math all the way through high school. And it wasn't really until college and then his graduate studies that it kind of clicked and maybe developmentally there were some mm -hmm. things there. And he really kind of embraced and fell in love with the discipline there. But he said because he remembered the struggle and right. especially conceptually things that he struggled with to formulate, it made him a better teacher because he sure. could relate to all the students, not just the ones that had a, you know, the light bulb turned on so right. quickly. Um, and, and that was his his take on it. I'm sure there's yeah. lots of ways to be a good so, math teacher. but So I kind of had the opposite experience. I did not struggle much. I mean, Everybody struggles a little bit, but I didn't struggle much with math all the way until grad school. Mm -hmm. And then I remember sitting in class and I, I, you know, the teacher would explain something and I'd be convinced they were speaking a different language. I just, <laughs> I had no idea what they were talking about and it was so frustrating. Yep. And um, I think that experience has made me a better teacher because I do know what it's like to sit there and be paying attention. I'm like, I'm a good student. Yeah. So to, to sit there and be trying your very best and still not for it to click, um, I know what that feels like. And um, and I had a professor tell me, I don't know if this is true, but she said, everybody struggles in math. If you haven't struggled in math, you just haven't gotten far enough yet. Yeah. And um, there's always another level. There's for, always for the another struggle. level. So, you know, I mm. tell my students that, okay, so this is where, you know, this is where you, you are encountering that struggle. Let's, you know, let's learn anyway. So I have a question that kind of digs on that just a little bit. <clears throat> so here at Maranatha, people take math even if they're not a math degree math major because they are that lucky right so can you explain why a curriculum should include math even if it's not going to get you to your career quote unquote sure there are a lot of skills just life skills that rely on you having uh, quantitative uh, literacy if you will right like you Whoa. have to be able to <laughs> like big words to handle <laughs> you know understanding numbers I mean you, you just watch the news and uh, you you reference Congress right they're, they're throwing out numbers about here let's raise the debt ceiling to this or that or the other thing and 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 you might instinctively know okay I don't like this idea or I do like this idea or whatever it is but unless you can quantify why it's sometimes hard to be persuasive or to even see what the, the net effect might be so I think there is a certain level of, of that kind of ability to understand numbers and what they mean um, that is important, um, you know, for everybody. And granted, some people learn it the hard way. You know, they they, um, they don't recognize that, you know, this number is, is too big. They don't have that much money in their checkbook, you know, <laughs> and they go in debt or whatever. Um, but if you can learn that ahead of time, you can maybe prevent some of those problems. But why should you take personal, why should you take college algebra and not personal finance? Well, we have a variety of math classes here at Maranatha. So depending on your career, you might take uh, a college math that is going to focus more on just like life skills. Um, but if you're going into something like business, then you're going to have to take a, a probability and statistics course, yep. which means you need to be able to handle formulas. And that's algebra. So I was very surprised in law school how much math there was. When we get into a class called Remedies, mm -hmm. and they're saying, okay, here's been some litigation and a car crash case, and so now we're going to decide how we're going to apportion liability right. between four or five different defendants and all these different elements of the damages that add up to this. And it's mostly it's for function math because lawyers mm -hmm. can't handle a whole lot more than that. <laughs> but, but you can't just say, well, I was never any good in math, so I can't help you. Calculating our fees, also another <laughs> huge math issue. But... 
that's uh, I, I think it is a real world skill, regardless of what you go into. And then we talked about math education. So math for everybody, math for education. But then also there's a mathematics degree itself. And we created mm-hmm. this degree not too long ago. So w- what could a person do with a an undergraduate degree in particular in mathematics? Sure. So um, it's a really diverse kind of options out there. Uh, they, uh, w- When you study math, you study a lot of different fields, including things like statistics. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a, a really great demand for like in, in the biological sciences for people that can do the statistical uh, measurements and data. You know, being a biostatistician is a, a really, you know, necessary job um you know it might be even in athletics um you know i don't know if you you know you you watch uh you know the jayhawks or whoever it is you're watching and they're talking about you know all of the different um you know data that they have that's going into all of that stuff and so there are people that go into that um people that go in uh you might need more training than just an undergrad but any kind of things that have networks at all um, you have to be able to um, analyze, and that kind of is in the field of graph theory. So, uh, you know, you're trying to decide, uh, you know, I work at the airport, and I want to make sure that um, I, I don't have planes that run into each other, like, you know, or the, <laughs> seemed to be like an issue recently. <laughs> Southwest Airlines' this whole entire system collapsed because they right. couldn't figure out where to get planes, crews, and passengers all at the same place right, at the same right. time. And there's, there's just all that, <laughs> that, that networking in an organization is, is, you know, math. Um, so all of those kinds of things, um, certainly with, um, you know, some things in engineering and then, and uh, pushing the boundaries on math itself, you know, um, going into math as a career. So uh, one last question, I know that you have students to help uh, today. And so we want to be mindful of that, but how, how do you suppose artificial intelligence is going to influence the future of math? Will it make it less necessary because the computers will do all the work or more so or will it help us push the boundaries in other ways or have you thought about that at all well we're already at this stage where a lot of what we teach in math classes you know with calculation is stuff that computers can do better (laughs) so you know i i tell my students if if all you have learned to do is calculate then all you have learned to do is become a really bad computer (laughs) because you're probably inefficient and you're probably not as accurate um, but, but the, somebody has to design the computer to do that, right? Somebody has to program it. Somebody has to figure out what are the ways that we can shorten the amount of calculations that have to be involved. And, and even just to the very level of, um, you know, estimating the right value. I don't know if it's happened to you, but you go to the grocery store and, and you look at, um, I was thinking this was going to be this much money and it's this much. And, you know, the computer just made a mistake, right? I mean, mm-hmm. not the co- computation, but whoever programmed it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we do need the background in calculation, even though nobody gets a job in being a human calculator, right? Good point. And I think AI is the same way. Uh, so it's going to push the boundaries forward of like what is capable for a computer to do. So there'll be less things that, that humans will have to do, but there's still going to have to be, um, you know, something... That, that is going to be our responsibility. Right. Someone has to put in the, the formula first, right? Someone has to ask. Once, ask but it. then after that, right. they just do it And maybe even discover the formula. Time. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, we so appreciate your time with us today. We appreciate your presence on this campus. We all, uh, we, we're very thankful for your uh, attitude towards the students too and not just your Amen. discipline. Well, I love this job. I'm glad to be here. Amen. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. On Mission is a production of Maranatha Baptist University. Subscribe to On Mission on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to leave a review as this will help other growing leaders find these conversations. For information about our guests, previous episodes, and general information about On Mission or MBU, go to mbu.edu podcast. Join us again next week as we examine what keeps leaders on mission.